Welcome back. Uh, my name is TC. I'm from the External Relations and Student Life Division uh, of the faculty, but I'm also a community member in SRN, the Singapore Research Nexus. But before the break, we heard about creativity as it is expressed in literary works of four languages of Singapore. And we heard five speakers talk about creativity and experience, aging, politics, personal growth, and authenticity. Now indeed, uh, we can understand creativity from multiple diverse perspectives. We're going to continue with this theme on diversity and creativity uh, in this session. We have four colleagues from our faculty, history, sociology, psychology, and communications and new media, to discuss how their disciplines and how they themselves, through their research and teaching, apprehend the concept of creativity. Now, each speaker will have 20 minutes before we have a, um, well, literally, fireside chat. Our first speaker is Lon Weiss. Now, Lon is an Associate Professor at Communications and New Media Department. Lon has a, a background in music, and his PhD actually uh, focused on a model of musical pitch perception. Lon researches and teaches on a number of issues but pertaining to sound, interactive media, and the arts. And the title of his talk is Creativity, Interdisciplinarity, and the New Relevance of the Arts. Lon, please. I wonder if I can be heard if I don't use a microphone. Is that okay? In back too? Okay. Um, we're really making a change of gears here. Uh, maybe this microphone can be turned down so it doesn't pick me up. Um, let's see. Can I just put it over here and it be fine? And uh, let me start off by saying I won't be talking about my research. I will uh, refer to it maybe once or twice, uh, but I'll be talking more uh, as an educator. And uh, I'm going to latch on to a term that Michelle used, uh, in that uh, we're interested in creating the conditions of creativity. And uh, that's what uh, 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 my work is oriented towards right now in communications in the media. And uh, so let me launch right into this. I'm going to talk in particular about the relationship of uh, science and the arts. And my first slide is really my what I'll be talking about today's slide, but it's in the form of a metaphor. So uh, when I, in, the, in the 80s, uh, people started talking a lot about left brain and right brain. And you, you got identified. You were either a left brain person or a right brain person. Well, that made me uncomfortable for many reasons. One is because um, you know, I had a background in music, but my way of exploring music was ever since I was a child, actually, through electronics and computers and a more scientific sort of approach to the sound of music. So I was never very comfortable with, about, uh, uh, with that, that model. And uh, this is how it gets depicted sometimes. This is actually an advertisement for Mercedes-Benz. And I, I see that the text is very small on the left, but it says it's left brain. I am the left brain. I love, I am a scientist, a mathematician. I love the familiar. I categorize. I am accurate, linear, and on and on about these stereotypes. And similarly on the right side, I am the right brain. I am creativity, a free spirit. I am passion, yearning, sensuality. I am the sound of roaring laughter, and on and on. So really what I'm going to talk about is the connections between these two. This is the corpus callosum, and it's not just a little cable that connects the left side to the right side. It's a rich, three-dimensional surface that reaches into almost every part of the brain. And that's what I want to talk about, is connections uh, and integration. Um, I also want to reflect on uh, what it was like when I came uh, to Singapore. Uh, at that time, uh, there was uh, no SMU, no, SMU, no Singapore University of Technology and Design. Uh, 
uh, no Marina Bay Sands, no Esplanade. Uh, La Salle was 10 years old, but it was tucked over on a, on a part of the island that was a little bit out of the way, and a quaint and beautiful campus, but uh, not exactly sensual uh, like it is now. There was no SOFA, no School of the Arts. Tish Asia hadn't been even thought of yet. Uh, no arts and digital media at, uh, at NTU. It was a very different world. The National Arts Council was only three years old when I arrived. <coughs> when I arrived, <coughs> excuse me, a friend of mine, an independent filmmaker in New York, sent me a film in the mail. In those days, I think it did. And I had to go down to MITA, what it was called, the Ministry of Information uh, uh, and, and in the arts, right? Uh, and uh, watch the film with people before I could actually take it home. It was a very different world than, than we live in now. The changes are fantastic, not just infrastructurally and buildings and what have you, uh, but as, as equally disorienting as the, the change in uh, cultural attitudes, really. And, and it's uh, astounding and really fun and exciting to be a part of. So I think what's in, important is, uh, is how we understand and value the arts as a society, because I, I think that's reflected in our institutions. Uh, and in the way that uh, young people grow up and think about what they value. And uh, so it's, it's really how we frame the questions, um, you know, how we create rewards, who's making the money in our society, uh, who's getting the recognition in, in the newspapers for that matter. All of those things really matter. And uh, it takes uh, a long time to, to make changes in this direction. It's harder to change cultural build a building, uh, because it takes a generation to do that. It takes role models, and it takes practice, and dialogue with people, and colleagues, and all this sort of thing. So there's been a lot of ways in which people think about art and science. But one of the ways that people talk about it is they try to make them equal. And uh, they think about, uh, I mean, in some ways, it's, a, it's a, uh, a worthwhile exercise to think about the similarities. So I don't need to say that they're there are not a lot of things that overlap. Certainly, science is creative. It involves the irrational and intuition. Um, you know, they say that the, the most important words in science uh, is not the logic, but the aha, or hmm, that's strange, right? This is, um, and it's subject to cultural limits. And how we fund science is, it has a lot of influence on what scientists think about and are willing to propose. And on the other hand, art does involve method. And uh, especially in the last few decades, uh, it's been very experimental. People set up situations where they don't know what's going to happen, and they try things and see, and then, in fact, they iterate today. A piece of artwork is often never finished. Uh, it goes through iterations, and, and we, we learn from how the audience responds and how things work or don't work. It's validated by the community. Uh, there's a convergence of tools, artists and uh, our artists and scientists are both working in a computation of the world today. And that's meant that we have a shared language that's changing the relationship between uh, these different means. Uh, there's been a lot of work in practice-based research. Uh, this comes largely out of the creative industries, and uh, especially in the UK and Australia, where uh, universities have really tried to prepare people and, and educate people at the highest level look at how creative work is done, think of art as a process of inquiry, and uh, look at what kind of benefits to knowledge and what kind of knowledge uh, art practice generates. Um, and uh, so we're, we really think of it that way. Uh, the question is about how do you evaluate uh, the contribution and the impact of what creative practitioners are doing is an important question in academia, especially where we have tenure and promotion boards, and uh, we have to think about uh, the same way that science is evaluated under the scrutiny of a committee of people who all have to agree that this is good work. We have to do the same thing now that uh, creative practitioners are part of our community. So we think of this uh, sort of equation. But on the other hand, we also and often fall into thinking about justifying art. Right? How, how can art benefit us? And this is a very different kind of question. Some of the ways that we often think about art is that you know, it drives scientific development with new questions. Right? So the creative people are out there thinking and, and uh, you know, pushing the envelope and, and generating questions that the scientists can address. And I mean, if, 
fact, that does happen to some degree. And in fact, uh, John Chowney uh, at Stanford University invented a new kind of sound synthesis in the 70s. It was based on frequency modulation. He found the same kind of thing that we used for radio. But he used it for generating uh, sonic timbres, like a trumpet or a violin. That patent that he got for Stanford for sound synthesis generated more money for Stanford for 15 years than any other patent that Stanford had. He came along at the right time, he could now keep it up, new synthesizer capabilities resulted, and he changed history. So, uh, art driving innovation. Um, we also tend to think about today, and I think it's quite common, art instruction teaches general creativity. That, that is, that we can educate engineers in, in artistic practices and expect that creativity to rub off in their other, other practices in engineering. Um, I think uh, uh, art functions uh, as science communications often. And I'll, I'll address that a little bit later. Of course, the creative industries is driving uh, this interest in, in why we want to be creative, this new design thinking that we, we talk about all the time now. Uh, and then there is the uh, increase in productivity that results when we take a little time for the arts and the uh, uh, enriching life aspect of the arts. So there's all these ways of justifying uh, our practice and study. Um, but what I want to talk about is actually uh, getting beyond the equating art and science, getting beyond subjugating uh, one to the other, and uh, and also beyond thinking of new media as a channel for reaching our audiences. And, and think about something else that's going on. And, and what I want to point to is the the practice that artists are engaging in these days, many artists, right, not all, of using scientific ideas and methods as the very material for their art. Right? Instead of paint, they're using genetics. Right? And uh, I think that this is uh, a very exciting area and where a, a lot of uh, innovation and discussions being generated in conferences and Art, Transmedia, Ars Electronica, Ars Electronica, a lot of the major uh, uh, venues for art are dealing with these kinds of practices. So I want to introduce a few pieces actually, uh, that deal with issues. Artists dealing with issues. It's, it's a matter of intersecting. It's that corpus callosum that we're talking about. It's not subjugating one to the other. It's where artists are working. So here's an example, uh, Evelina Dominich and Dimitri uh, Galfan. This is camera lucida, and uh, what they do is they are visualizing the sound. So they're, they're transforming uh, sound from the body plate into ultrasound, putting it into a liquid, which is rich in xeon, and in fact the liquid is, uh, is uh, has, has acid enriched, and is luminescent. So, the music actually creates patterns uh, uh, in the liquid that you can view. Right? So um, uh, they also do wonderful work with, with sound, uh, levitating uh, uh, trace elements of gold and silver, which have influence how the sound passes through the air and uh, interact with the sound. They do wonderful things with physics. Um, Steve Potter is a neuroscientist at Georgia Tech, and he works with Symbiotica uh, in Australia. And Symbiotica is a, is a lab that uh, is in the context of a biological group of researchers, but it's an artist uh, community that's uh, colonized by uh, biology. And uh, they did this piece called Mirit, uh, the Semi-Living Artist, and they're using uh, rat brain cells, rat brain cells, uh, to generate electrical signals, which are transmitted over the internet to a robot arm in another part of the world, which then uh, draws. Okay. So they're exploring uh, <clears throat> many different levels of questions and issues that we're dealing with in society today through art. And um, I, I mean, actually in biological art, it's probably the most active scientific domain is being explored by artists. Uh, and, uh, genetics is, is a big one. 
I mean, I could have shown an example there, but uh, this one is also nice because it, it shows another important theme, which is the relationship between body and digital technologies that a lot of artists are doing. Stellar comes to mind as uh, somebody who exposed this to, where people on the internet would do something on the web that would create electrical impulses that would make his muscles move in performance. Um, so, and he's famous for saying that the, the body is, is, is uh, an anachronism. It's not really that important. Cognition embodied in something besides the body. So, the, the issue is not really very right wrong, of course. The issue is that he's bringing up these topics and the material of his art is the scientific question. Jason Freeman at Georgia Tech, also coincidentally from Georgia Tech, a musician who works in the social domain. Uh, what you're looking at here is an audience uh, who are wearing these sort of silly hats with lights on them. And uh, as they move around the space, they're creating a score in real time, which is interesting in and of itself, if you ask a musician like me. And uh, then that score is played by uh, musicians. It's kind of sort of in a traditional way, the score is, of course, moving and changing. It's a dynamic score. But it's, uh, he's really exploring the relationship between audience members and how they construct uh, a piece of music with live musicians. And, and there's different roles that different people play, of course, the musicians in the audience, but the audience as well. Um, and uh, this is a theme of his, really, the social, looking at one piece of art from completely different experiences, right? The people have different experiences at the same you have to wonder if it's only one or pushing issues such as that. Uh, Jason Wee is a uh, Singaporean. He's at uh, the South College. And uh, he did this piece called So Close to Desert Isle. And this is an interesting socio-political uh, issue that he's working with. It, it, this piece was about an island that was contested between Malaysia and Singapore. And uh, what he did is he worked with Chris. The Center for Marine and Image and Satellite Communication. Um, and uh, run by uh, Bernard Penn. And uh, he was getting pictures of himself sort of invading the island on the boat. Uh, and uh, I actually helped him do this piece, and we moved to the, as it turns out, the uh, Ministry, Ministry of Finance, I believe, is ultimately to say yes or no to this. Well, who ultimately said, no, he can't go on the island. But it didn't matter. The piece he documented got photos, and uh, he's working with those issues of them about whether he makes it to the island or the expedition. Uh, Angelo Vermula, who, who, as it turns out, has also been to Singapore, did this piece, piece, which is really one of the most, my favorite of all art science pieces. Uh, and uh, I think, uh, I'll tell you about it. Uh, you, you walk into a room, and I saw this in 2006 in San Jose, and you're confronted with these tanks of obviously aquatic life forms, and there are these minute aquatic life forms uh, in the top half of the tank, swimming around. And the light's essentially white or yellow, and occasionally turns blue. Well, these aquatic life forms uh, run away from blue light, the blue light averse. And so they go down through the water and through these tiny holes in the floor, what seems to them to be the sort of floor, but there's fish down there that eat those aquatic life forms. Right? So when the blue light goes on, they go down, but not all of them go down. Right? So there's a lot of them, hundreds of thousands of them. So some of them don't, and those are the ones that are to reproduce. And so then you're actually watching the process of evolution. Well, when does the blue light come on, you ask? When you walk up and put your face up to the tank, that's when the blue light is. <laughs> and suddenly you're struck with the fact that you are participating in this process of evolution. There's nothing closer to the sublime in the classical sense, in my view, than this piece is covered in the world of art and science. So uh, I love this work. I'm sorry, so this is not. I'm dealing with, in this case, uh, ethical issues. And that's a very common theme now uh, that artists are dealing with, whether it's physics or biology or whatever it is. Uh, it's the ethical issues that we're working with for. Um,
So the question is, yes, but is it art? Is it art? Right? We ask this, but in hindsight, I think we can see that they are doing things that artists have always done. You know, making things new, giving us fresh perspective, uh, as, as the literature has been taking us So globally, this is uh, just a trend. There's art and science, artists in labs kind of projects going on all over the world now. Uh, interdisciplinary awareness, computer scientists, Science departments are hiring ethnographers. Uh, there's a rise of the creative industries, world leading universities in the art type. I did this one by one. I looked at the top 40 university, universities in the Times listing and found that 38 out of the 40 have arts faculty, and many of them offer BFAs. And so, this is uh, top universities thinking of art as a natural part of an education. Uh, locally, uh, obviously, the arts have been on the rise over the years. Um, so much has happened as we listed, but at the National University of CNN, we now have 20 courses that we offer in interactive media design. So that's what we've really built up in the past few years. Uh, the uh, NGS, which is the Integrated uh, Graduate School of Science and Engineering, uh, hired, uh, brings students in, they don't join the department, they get co-supervision from different faculties. And at CNM, a couple of us have these students that are great students, and it makes for collaborations naturally across faculty and for a great program of student. Um, in 2008, we hosted the uh, International Symposium on Electronic Arts. This was a, a big conference in the arts. But the amazing thing about this particular year, this one that we held in Singapore, is that NUS kicked in and hosted the 16 main art juried artists that were, did their uh, pieces at the National Museum, hosted them for three months each here in research labs at the university, three months each. And uh, I coordinated this, found a research lab for each artist, put them together, and they, every one of them finished their works uh, uh, with the uh, involvement and engagement of researchers and uh, did these amazing pieces, which I would love to tell you about. What I will tell you is that this year we have a new program. This one is funded by the National Arts Council. And I think it's the first time the National Arts Council has funded anybody at the university other than the Center for Fine Arts, which of course is an arts oriented organization. Uh, we, we sold a good story about how we're really interested in the arts. We're not just taking arts money and spending it on science. And uh, the Center for Quantum Technologies, the Conservatory of Music, the Aquatic Science Center, and it's the Delft Singapore Water Alliance and the Asian Biopolis uh, group by Greg Clancy are all hosting artists in the coming few months. And we'll make an announcement about that in visual artists and selections within a couple of, uh, of weeks. But I want to point out that this is not just the hard sciences. There's the, uh, the Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences is represented here at the Asian Biopolis Conservatory of Music uh, this year. So my final slide is that it's about convergence and integration. Um, and the conditions for creativity that I see are really uh, the bringing the multiplicity that exists in our society together, where they can bump into each other and interact with each other. And that needs to be reflected not only in a society where the South is on one side of the island and the West is on the other, but in each educational uh, institution. How do we find inclusion and inclusion in what I actually daily work towards your work. So 